some artists are so on it and they'll email me and they'll be like, they email me, they send me breakdowns, they'll send me stats, they'll send me data, they'll tell me, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, like they're on it. You got to want it more than I do, right? Like I'm, I'm support. <laughs> I'm not the main act. I'm not, I'm not, my yeah. name is not the one written. I'm not the primary artist. You are. My job is support. But if I want yeah. it more than you, it's not going to work. What's going on? Welcome to the new music business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book. Third edition is out now everywhere. All formats, hardcover, ebook, audiobook. You want to listen to it, you can find it where you, you find audiobooks or any book. Uh, it's on all bookstores. Check it out. Today, my guest is Moody Jones. He is currently the GM of dance at Empire. Empire is an independent distribution company and record label. They also have publishing division. They have sync and our everything. Empire has evolved a lot over the years. Uh, previously, he uh, was the SVP, Senior Vice President of Digital and Creative, uh, working on campaigns with Youngblue, Busta Rhymes, XXX, Tentacion, Snoop Dogg, Aaliyah, a um, bunch. And, uh, but as the GM of dance now at Empire, he is recently, they acquired uh, Claude Von Stroke's Dirty Bird Records, which uh, if you remember, we had the uh, Dirty Bird label manager, uh, Darren Dell got on the show not too long ago. And so this is kind of the second episode that uh, we we dive into the dance music world. Uh, this is a side of the industry that uh, I love learning about because I'm just not super involved in. And so it's it's really fun to have these conversations. And uh, Moody dropped endless gems throughout this episode. And even if you're not in the dance music uh, realm. I encourage you to listen to this because he's got a lot of wisdom. He talks, uh, we talk a lot about just artistry and branding and marketing. And he even has towards the end, uh, a really interesting idea about how approaching streaming services, these DSPs kind of as, as a social network and uh, how that works. I think you're going to learn a lot from this and, uh, yeah, I had a great time chatting with, with Moody Jones. You can find Moody Jones on Instagram and TikTok. Oh yeah, he's also an artist and he has great music. You can find his music on DSPs as well. He does remixes. And so, you know, he's he's uh fully in it, uh wearing many, many hats, the multi-hyphenate as kind of we all are. Um so you can you can find him just at Moody Jones pretty much everywhere, Instagram, TikTok, uh the DSPs, all of that. Uh you can find Empire on Instagram that's just at Empire and uh, their website, of course. Uh, you can find all of us that make the show happen at Ari's Take on Instagram, TikTok, X Threads, all of that. You can find me at Ari Hurston on Instagram. But uh, real quick, uh, visit Ari'sTake.com. Get on the email list. That's where you're going to get the most up to date information. Uh, we'll send you stuff about new episodes dropping and just info about the new music business. Get on the email list. Uh, but right now, if you could just pause this episode, leave us a five star review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. And uh, hit the subscribe, hit the follow button, wherever you're listening to this. Leave us a comment on YouTube. If you're not listening on YouTube, you just want to head over and leave us a comment there. I like checking those out. All right, let's kick into the show. Moody Jones, welcome to the show. What's up, Ari? How you doing? Um, I'm doing good. Good, good. So, uh, yeah, we got the curls rocking here today. This is this is fantastic. Not not too often do I I get guests that uh, with with curls that that rival mine. But um, yeah, it's nice. Um, so so tell me for people that aren't familiar with Empire, um, I think it's a it's a really interesting setup and kind of sets itself uh, apart in the industry uh, for kind of its independence and just all of its offerings and everything you've been there a minute now uh just give us like an overview of of what empire is sure so um empire is an independent record label that started off um over 10 years ago as a distributor and then quickly start you know started offering all the services that artists needed uh mm -hmm. the more we wanted to you know, be, become a better partner, the more we started transitioning and, and, and becoming a label. Yeah. And then today, uh, we do everything from publishing to partnerships, the sync, the, you know, admin royalties, um, A&R, 
you know, the whole yeah. gamut, anything an artist could want. Um, and then we have, we even have, you know, the infrastructure from recording. We have studios here in New York, London. Uh, we have offices in Africa, in Europe, um, a couple, a few in America. So, you know, what, whatever, uh, hmm. you know, artists needs uh, international push and international experience and, and teams mm -hmm. behind them to push their records today. And so yeah. we have to grow our teams accordingly. That's great. And, you know, it is uh, over the last 10 years, um, I feel like distributors, like how Empire has evolved, are kind of, you know, uh, evolving into this more label direction or offering label services, moving that. And similarly, labels are moving, some of them are moving in the other direction and everyone's kind of meeting somewhere in the middle where uh, taking on label services, distribution. I mean, you know, even the majors are offering deals these days that we're seeing that are reminiscent of strictly what indies used to offer. And we're seeing distributors offering advances and everything is just so blurry right now. Um, I'm curious, like when you say it's independent, you mean it's not connected to any of the three majors, right? No. So we've never taken on investment. There is no stakeholders. It has a sole owner, which is Ghazi Shami, who is our CEO. Mm -hmm. uh all of this is you know the, you know he's the brains behind everything all of this is his vision his image mm -hmm. which is why our head office is in san francisco because that was one of the main pillars for him was bringing back the art the art and the culture back to the city uh cool. which is one of the reasons why i moved to san francisco and uh yeah i mean i think that's also one of our competitive advantages is like bring a private company you know, there's a lot yellow, a lot less yellow tape. There's a lot less yeah. bureaucracy. There's a lot less admin, you know, decisions get made faster. Uh, cool. this, you, you make a very good point. The same reason, like all these majors are kind of a hybrid and everyone's kind of offering the same deals or, or, or indie structures. Um, mm -hmm. They could do all of that, but they still have to answer to someone above. They still have to pass it up the chain until they get approval for certain things. Whereas yeah. for us, you know, the market is moving so quick that we have to make sure that we're able to put the troops in the right places in order to get things moving quicker. Cool. No, that's great. And I mean, um, so for the for the publishing part of the business, um, are you partnered with uh, any any indie publishers or admin uh, administrators or anything like that? Or is it all in house? It's it's all in house. There's certain territories that we work with other companies uh, to run the admin in, but that's mm -hmm. also be, I'm sure sooner or later, those territories will also become in homes. Cool. That's great. Um, so let's talk, I, I know you took over kind of the dance division or started the dan dance division uh, a couple years ago, two, three years ago. Um, I, and, you know, we had Darren Delgado from Dirty Bird Records on the show not too long ago. Um, so the listeners are kind of familiar with Dirty Bird. And I know that you acquired uh, Dirty Bird. Talk to me about kind of the dance division, the dance market right now. You know, I, from my conversation night, full transparency, uh, this is not a scene that I am super familiar with. And like, yeah. I was, uh, you know, my biggest takeaway from like the conversation I had with Darren was that uh, the dance community, the dance industry is still selling downloads, which just like, just blew my mind. I, I like, I hadn't had right. a, I hadn't said the word digital download in probably <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> and like, yeah. we spent a lot of the time talking about it. So like, Talk to me about what the dance music uh, industry looks like these days now in 2024 and just kind of from your vantage point, what it, what you're seeing. The reason, uh, I mean, I've, I've been at Empire for six years. I just passed the six years mark. And, um, you know, over my tenure over here, I, oh, you know, I used to be the senior vice president of digital and creative. So I oversaw all the marketing for most of our acts from in hip hop, Latin, Nashville, African, um wanna and then i kind of like you know i wanted to do something a little different and so i i you know Ghazi actually was the one who was like i think you should run your own division uh cool. what do you think about doing dance um and the the biggest i mean the, the biggest difference in dance and everything else is honestly the consumer is just completely different mm. um you know where you know we just came back from uh miami music week uh, which has also been going around for over, uh, almost, I think, 25 years now. 
and it's only mm-hmm. getting bigger and it's getting longer. But you know, some of the shows were like five hundred dollars for a ticket. You know what I mean? Which is wow. and for acts that you you wouldn't even imagine. And some of these acts, honestly, uh, probably have like eighty thousand monthly listeners. But they have fans that are willing to spend five hundred dollars to go see them, you know. And then mm. it's and and even at the shows, it's very different. They're not very like March uh, merch oriented. Like people don't buy merch. There isn't even a merch booth. That's not something you usually do it at dance shows. Wow. It's more about yep. inclusivity and community. Um, and like the songs are a bit longer. The 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 arrangements of records are different. And I think what happened after uh, after the vid. Uh, is basically people went from you know being stuck at home for a couple of years. Uh, I haven't heard. I haven't heard to refer to as the vid yet. I love that you're giving this uh, <laughs> this time period uh, uh, a shorthand. Okay, great. I'm I'm with you now. Yeah. After the vid. Uh, yeah, hit me. After the vid, <laughs> um, people, you know, were listening to music at home a lot more often. They were listening to a lot of yeah. genres, um, and then when they came out, the energy was just different. It was no longer about uh when we were sitting at home we were more concerned about you know like their dating life the artist's dating life and what they're saying and their opinions about things and if they're vaccinated or not and then after all of this we're like you know what i don't really care about the stuff anymore i just care about the show i just care about the perform i just care about what i get in return and so you started to see you'll see that today more and more there's more opinions coming out of people being unhappy at certain shows and being disappointed mm. and not feeling like the artist performed really well or the set list was too short or it was too expensive for what I got in return, things like that. And um, in the dance, I mean, like the shortest party I went to during music week was probably like six hours and the longest party was 36 hours, you know? Wow. A 36 okay. hours. Yeah. It's very different. Um, yeah. And like, <laughs> and like uh, spending... 36 hours, if you're able to, in the same venue, mm-hmm. listening to like that, that night alone builds a community. And mm. that night alone builds like a strong connection between a fan and an artist, mm. which is almost like listening to someone's album, let's say 36 times. Yeah. You know what I mean? In yeah. one night, I probably wow. did that. You know what I mean? It's so it's very different. The bond you built, the connection you have. Mm. Um, and then you'll come back over and over. You, you build that loyalty by just showing up and being there. Mm. And, um, what's happening is like with the rise of Emma piano and a lot of dance music coming out of South Africa and Nigeria and Ghana that we're importing over here there, it's coming here and then it's being reshaped and re-edited and coming back as like house music back to them. And so now we're having this like beautiful, like cross genre cross culture melting point dance floor where that's very inclusive which is what dance music has always been about is inclusivity and acceptance and uh so it's like very exciting it's like a time where no one knows what's going to happen but and at the same time people don't realize like dance music started off in detroit the same reason a lot of the detroit rappers started but you never see detroit rappers and detroit djs working together because Mm -hmm. of um, you know, as soon as Detroit blew up, like as soon as there was sort of like a, a, a civil war in Detroit that led to mm. them never actually working together and then like actually exiling the city. And now it's happening for the first time. Wow. Um, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the same as like trap music. Trap music was when the hurricane hit New Orleans and people left New Orleans and moved to Atlanta and things like that. And that created trap mm. music, which was like the start of like this hip hop dance uh community you know mm-hmm. so a lot of times from trauma or from external factors a new genre is born and that genre is usually a more positive and more happy sounding to get over the current state of things yeah no that that's a that's great and that's uh really really fascinating uh, with the history and everything but uh, so uh i'm curious about kind of uh the business model around all of this when you know you're mentioning that a lot of these artists, uh, they don't have a big, li- like streaming listenership. You know, I'm, I'm going, just going down some of like the the largest artists, you know, on the roster, and it's just like, yeah, you said, you know, their listener numbers are negligible. I, I can't imagine that anyone can sustain 
on the revenue being generated from streaming uh, in the dance realm, or at least, you know, these indie uh, dance artists, uh, especially as a dance label, kind of where are you seeing the majority of the revenue coming from? Or are your deals structured in a different way that kind of knowing that uh, they make so much in the live space that you're going to kind of cater more to the live community? Or, or how is that all? How does that work? And that was a different. So uh, it's a very good question. So usually uh, our the record labels have always operated on like the album record option model. Yeah. Um, and that's generally how things been. But because I, I, you know, I was lucky enough to start this dance division. To me, it doesn't make sense, especially with up and coming acts. Like one of the first you know, pieces of advice we always give an artist that's up and coming is like, there's no reason to rush an album, like build that story, build that narrative, get people interested, figure out your sound, figure out your creative direction. Then once you actually have something and people are asking for an album, then put it out. Yeah. And so if that's the case, then why am I going out to sign artists and then asking them for two albums? Like that doesn't make sense. So instead we operate on a, on a, on single deals or, or song deals. And mm -hmm. it could be, you know, five to 10. Um, and then if it's cool, let's keep this relationship going. If not, then like no one wants to be in a relationship where one of us is unhappy or one of us is working more than the other. Right. Sure. A toxic relationship. So, <laughs> uh, so, so on the dance deals, we focus more on like songs and like we try and deliver that every song is a, is its own story and its own narrative. And essentially is an experiment to see if that's the one that matches uh, with their, their expression. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is one of the biggest, uh, differences as well is the way artists navigate and spend their budgets on the dance side compared to other genres is completely different. Um, awesome. a lot of, a lot of times when you're speaking to the artist on the dance side, that is also the composer. That is also the producer. That is also the vocalist sometimes, you know? So I'm actually sure. speaking to the artist. I'm actually speaking to everyone involved in the project. So that's one, two, in terms of a lot of these artists that, you know, they're not shooting music videos, they're not doing press photos. They're not like, that's not what they're doing. Their, their bread and butter is actually being behind the decks or actually being at the show or actually being outside. Right. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. they'd rather use that money to have a better show, to have be better visuals, to have better special effects, um, to have a feature. So the, the way the budgets are spent are also very, very different. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, you know, even if when we have deals going, majority of them don't even spend their budgets. Like we'll literally, we'll beg them to spend. They're like, why? Like I'm, I'm already in a positive place. I sure. don't owe you shit and yep. I'm making money. And I was like, yep. yeah, I'm totally. Um, yep. and, and, it, and it's when you're in that position as an artist, that you're able able to deliver your best work. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I'm not stressed. I'm not in the yeah. red. Um, yeah. I can experiment even more. And and that's the and I'm I'm happy with the support system that I had, you know? Yeah, that's great. What's the um what are you looking for from the the artists uh in terms of like a uh a return or where's their where's the majority of the revenue coming from? from is it from streams is it from record sales is it from downloads is it are you participating in the live space uh like when you bring on an artist like what how are you gauging success that like this signing has been a successful signing um a very good question as well so during our calls before even a, a deal is drafted out that's one of the very uh, key questions that we ask is like, hey, what does success look to you mm -hmm, as an artist, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And it's important for both of us to understand what success looks like so that we enter this relationship knowing what someone's bringing to the table and what my partner's bringing to the table so that we're both yep. going after that same finish line. Yes. Otherwise, like, you know, I think success is the revenue and you think success is Instagram followers. And then you're upset because your revenue is up, but your followers are down, right? Yep, and then yep. we're like, well, we spoke about this and we both agreed this is what success looked like. Yes. So for a lot of, for overall, the way our success is broken down is usually, it is first and foremost, definitely royalty revenue streams, downloads, um, vinyl sales, merch sales, ticket sales. Yep. Um, 
Uh, and it could be whatever combination of those, you know, like start, I have dance artists that don't tour, that don't do shows. Oh, you wow. don't do tour and you don't do shows and you only put out music. Then like, obviously we're both looking at revenue from streams as a success. Right. Yeah. Um, and, but, and if that, and if I'm not going to ask you to tour because that's, we already agreed that wasn't something you're going to be doing. Yep. Um, so, and it's different. And some artists I'll sign just because, you know, I'll listen to their music and I'm like, this belongs in a movie. Right. And I'm like, mm. I can literally see the scene in my head, you know? Cool. And so maybe it's not even revenue stream. Sometimes it's just like putting it in Sick. the right scene so that it's appreciated. Yep. Sick. Um, in terms of, uh, marketing, what are kind of the avenues these days uh, that you're finding are the best ways to market dance music? The, one of the best ways to market dance music today is getting it in the hands of other DJs to play it. Mm. To me, that because DJs are essentially our, our new curators, right? That's that's yep. what radio always was. Radio has always yeah. been DJs playing records. So yep. today, no one's listening to the radio, but everyone's listening to DJs at the club. Like we talked about, people spending thirty six hours in the club, right? There's a that's a huge share of voice, right? If mm. I can just get my song between all four hundred songs you're going to play that night, you know that's that's as good as it gets. My songs being heard, and then if it's heard. It gets associated with a moment. Like I'll never forget hearing that song for the first time when I was in Miami and it sunrise was coming up and this guy was wearing re this weird outfit. And my curls, my curls looked amazing. And like, you know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> some, some, yeah. but you yeah. that moment to me, that's the best. And the way to do that is relationship building, right? It's mm -hmm. having solid music and having relationships with artists. Like I'll personally text or, or WhatsApp. Most CJs are use WhatsApp. And I'd be like, hey, like, I feel like the song works in your set. And they're mm. like, oh, totally, for sure. I'm like, cool. And like, I won't, I won't say anything else. And then they'll shoot me a video later on and be like, yeah, look, this, this song is actually fire. Look at the crowd react to this. Sick. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times we, I even do that before signing a record. Oh, like oh, yeah, to test it out, to see how the, the audience responds. Absolutely. Yeah. A hundred percent. Sometimes, you know, I have a folder that of all songs I'm not sure of. There are songs that are great, but there are songs that I can't see people listening to it at home, but mm -hmm. I can see people listening to it in the car or as they're at a party. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, I wonder how it would sound like at a party and I'll send it to people and they'll send me the reaction. And, and a lot, and sometimes like even the clear records, sometimes, you know, I'll remix a record and the artist is like, I don't like it. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's because they don't understand it. Sometimes it's yeah. a different culture. Sometimes it's, and then I'll send them a video. I'm like, look, and they'll be like, oh, okay, this has to come out. Yeah. 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 Sick. Um, so, and it just kind of like help me understand, uh, like complete the cycle for me of, so the record gets played by a DJ in a club. Um, and how does that like dumb it down for me? How is that helping market the record? Do people in there hear it? You like you said they, you know, they remember this this song. Are they like shazamming it right there? Then right. they and then do you see like an instant spike on Spotify or like people right. are buying the record, uh, or downloading? I mean, like how, what what happens next after they hear it in the club and like that's a success? Cool. So let's let's take it from um, the point of view of different people at the club, right? Okay. So one, let's start from the people that are in front of the art, in front of the DJ. So they hear yeah. it, like you said, they'll shazam it. If they shazam it, they don't find it. Then they're going to take a video because they're like, oh, okay, okay. I got to figure out how I'm going to find this record later. All right. And then while they're there, um, they might be like, you know what? I'm going to go home later and try and find this whole set. So I can like take this part from the song and then try and find it myself. Right. Cool. From, from the side that's next to the DJ, so that's the people that are like backstage, VIP, whatever. Mm -hmm. They see the crowd reaction. They're like, oh, I got to add this to my playlist, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I got to add this, yeah. whatever. Then you have the video guy, the content people. They see how people are reacting. They're like, oh, you know what? When I cut up this video, I think that's the song I'm going to use because people really oh. love the song, especially yeah. if the song's not out yet. 
then it's like yeah. a makes it even crazier that people want to watch my video. Yeah. Then, you know, like I, I did this with a record recently, the day it dropped, um, it had, I think 40,000 Shazams the day it dropped because the three months before that it was never out, but it was still being registered. And so the day oh, it dropped, wow. it finally registered and I had 40,000, you know oh, what I no mean? Shit. I didn't realize it did that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so having a number like that then looks really good to editors. Then it looks really good to artists. And you know what I'm saying? So then it helps build a so, crazy, like it's so it's like, what's better, like a pre-save or someone actually shazamming a record before it's out. Yeah, you know what I'm yeah. saying? <laughs> like they <laughs> actually heard it and said, yes, I want to, I want to remember this. They actually yeah. pre-saved it on Shazam. They should actually have yeah. that feature. Um, that's sick. Yeah, yeah, I know that's a great feature. I didn't even realize that that was happening. That it was essentially pre-saving in the uh, from that from Shazam. That's cool. Yeah, and then um, and then again, and then like the artists now, and then now we have content for promo. Right now, I could use this content from the video for Instagram ads, for TikTok ads, for whatever. You know what I'm saying? I could run an ad and say the song you everyone's been wanting, the song with forty thousand Shazams is finally released. Mm -hmm. Like all of this is just one DJ playing a record at a good party. That's, you know what I'm saying? And so yep. the DJ is the real influence. The DJ is the mm. real curator. The DJ is the real person that, because, you know, we do all this marketing and we try and target the ideal demographic, but the mm -hmm. ideal demographic is actually that guy behind the deck that's playing to the exact chains that you made the song for. That's right. That's right. It, does digital play in this at all? In terms of marketing? Yeah, we, we for sure do a lot of uh, TikTok ads, Instagram ads. Um, we do we even do um, a lot of Snapchat ads because a lot of our music really moves in Africa and, and Africa is really known for hum audio Mac ads. Um, yep. Audio Mac is one of the most popular DSPs there. And so we do a lot of audio Mac ads um, cool. and then influencer campaigns. But we try and like hmm. the the the. It's really funny if you ever take the time and look at influencer posts for like hip hop music or pop music, and then look at the ones for dance music, you'll realize the difference in consumers, right? Um, when you see a post on like World Star or rap or like one, one of the very big hip hop pages, people yeah. in the comments are on it. They're they're literally having full on conversations. They all have input. They all have whatever. You'll see that the comments are one of the highest engaging um, actions on a post. Mm, okay. If you go look at a dance post, it's actually the send button that's the most used because oh, wow. people just DM it to people, but no one really wants to comment or say anything negative or anything. They're just like, yo, have you seen this? That's it. So that Sick. tells you a lot about the consumer. They're like, mm. they're not the ones to co literally comment on things, but yeah. they're watching and they see what it is and, that, and that's it. Nice. Nice. Um, with what's happening on uh, TikTok right now with uh, UMG kind of pulling everything, did that affect any of your recordings or any of your artists? Has that affected? Um, it only affects artists if their publishing went through Universal, which was in a, a large uh, percentage for us. Okay. Um, we, but we, from the get-go, Empire has always been like, put it up everywhere. Anyone can have it. We don't care. Like, you know, we, we come from the distribution mindset. The more people have access to it, the better. Yep. Um, so like we would never, we would never, like it's not something we, that we like we would pursue for us. Mm -hmm. Like, be, like we want people to be able to have, to go on Spotify and Apple and not need a credit card to listen to music. You know, like we're mm -hmm. not trying to mm -hmm. add more layers to, to separate the fan from the list, from the, from the artist. So to us, we didn't have much of a negative impact. Um, and you know, we'll see, we'll see how this ends up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for, uh, aspiring producers, DJs, uh, artists in the dance community, um, what do you tell them when they are, you know, might have, they're like a bedroom producer or something and they have, you know, some great tracks, uh, maybe great remixes, uh, but they don't really know the next steps. Like, what's your advice to them? Um, is this a producer who doesn't play any shows? This is just 30 starting early on. 
they're starting early on they're kind of the bedroom producer they might have you know a soundcloud channel or something like that and they're just kind of releasing their music uh there and and uh, might be doing remixes and stuff like that but yeah maybe they'd be open to it but they just just don't know what to do next i think the first thing um i would advise them to do is figure out like what you and i talked about earlier ari is hey bedroom producer figure out what success is to you Hmm. um it's no longer a unilateral direction to success you know there's and and a lot of labels are starting to realize that some artists just want to be a one-hit wonder and there's nothing wrong with that some Hmm. artists just want to tour and never want to put out new music again and that's fine you know so figure out what you want to do are you you know, are you an, a bedroom DJ who just wants to start building on early retirement? So I'm going to put out 10 songs that make me a thousand bucks a month and then I can retire. You know what I mean? Like there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. That's a great retirement yeah. plan. Yeah. You know, so yeah. decide what it is you want to do. It doesn't, you know, I see so many people go through so many, uh, you know, mental issues and physical issues and and have a lot of sacrifices to make with their families just because they take on shows for, for no money or spend all their money on so many things that don't really move the needle. And I don't know if you really stop and think, do I actually want this or, or is mm. this just what I'm supposed to do as an artist? Yeah. You know what yep. I mean? Like, um, and, and my second piece of advice is uh, art isn't just in the music art is, and everything you do, like you should, you should get used to being alone. Art, art should be in the way you market, in the way you write your name, in the way you post. Like when you see people post cool content and you like it, you should aspire to be like that and have content like that. Yep. Most of us like artists, not because of their music anymore. It's because of what they stand for. Yes, And the reason they stand for something is because they stand for something different than what everyone else is saying. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's easy to, it's just decide, decide what kind of artist you are. That's great. Uh, really well put. Um, you know, some people call that kind of branding, uh, it, more on the, on the marketing side, more of the, the cold hearted marketing people call that branding, but I like how you put it is that art is in everything that you do. Uh, yeah, that's really well put in. And, and we do see that it's, you know, fans aren't uh, following artists because of they like one song, they might follow a, a playlist because they like the songs on there, but they're gonna they're gonna really follow an artist for life because of what that artist stands for who they are, everything that's about them. Uh, it just makes sense because everything is filtered through them, the artist um, from what they post, of course, and the music that they make but just how they look at the world and you see that that is represented in everything they do when they're performing um you know on their socials all of that um so yeah that's that's really well put when you bring on a new artist um and you might think them in let's say you think the music is brilliant but they don't quite have a handle on everything else um you know the branding i guess isn't isn't quite in line or maybe they just they don't know how to connect it all together and you think they're a brilliant artist, but that's not being adequately represented publicly yet. Mm-hmm. What, are, what are your next steps? Kind of how do you work with that artist? Uh, honestly, th- those, those happen often. And I'm sure a lot of uh, label execs have similar experiences. But, you know, luckily we're in a position where our roster is very diverse and our roster is extensive. And, and, it's, and it, we have artists from everywhere, all wakes of life. At my current position, it really is, is that someone I want to have a relationship with? Is, you know what mm. I'm saying? Like, like literally characters, you know, because you can have the best music in the world, but like you and I just don't get along. We just don't speak the mm-hmm. same language. You yep. know what I mean? We don't speak the same language. We don't have to say, like I have, like some artists are so on it and they'll email me and they'll be like, they email me, they send me breakdowns, they'll send me stats, they'll send me data, they'll tell me, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, like they're on it. You got to want it more than I do. Right. Like I'm, I'm support. I'm not the main act. I'm not, I'm not, my name is not the one written. I'm not the primary artist. You are my job is support, but if I want it more than you, it's not going to work. So 
and so, and and it's the opposite. Sometimes your music is not that great, but you want it so bad. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, let's let's do it. Like let's let's figure it out. You know what I mean? Because yeah. you you're I'm 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 not worried about your work ethic. I'm not worried about your your core values. I'm not worried about your determination. I'm not worried about your ambition. Right? These these should be basics that like every artist should have figured out. You know what I mean? And if that's figured yep. out, then like the music, the creative art, the creative part will figure out together. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So for the artists that are listening to this and, and are feel fully aligned and like, you know what, M, you know, Moody's my guy, Empire is my label. How do I get? How do I get to Moody? How do I get to Empire? How do I? How do I uh, build this partnership? What What do you uh, What do you say to them? I, I mean, if uh, if you know anyone in the building, hit them up. If you want to hit me directly, uh, you can. You can like I every other day. From 11 to 12, just so everyone knows, from 11 to 12, I have an hour of listening to demos. Um, and and sometimes Sick. I'll even time my flights so that on the flight, I will listen to those demos from 11 to 12. But cool. I listen to every single thing. and even But even after I like it, I will pass it by my team. And I make sure that everyone's heard it as well. And everyone agrees because mm. I want everyone on this team to be waving your flag, not just me. I want, yeah. you know, we're... We work in music, you know, we're so lucky. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and so <laughs> the last thing you want to do is be in music and, and have your dream job and work at a dream company, but then work on a project you don't really love. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's a yeah. sad ending. So, you know, I'm like, mm. let's all listen to it. Do you guys feel it? Do you guys agree? And, you know, as, as long as more than half the team is like, no, I totally get it. I totally see it. Then cool. But it would never be like, hey, guys, I don't care. I like this artist. We're signing them. Because honestly, I respect everyone too much to do that. And I respect <laughs> the artist too much to put them in that position. Sure. That's that's great. Um, how often are you uh, kind of getting out to shows these days and getting in the club and, and doing these these all night parties? Every day. Really? You're you're in it. You're you're in I'm it. In that's it. great. I'm in it. I'm in it. Like, and honestly, like you could listen to the song and you're not going to understand it, but you go to the show and you're like, what the hell is this? Mm. You know? And that's a big part of signing artists too. Like I like going to a show and seeing how the artist talks to staff, how the artist talks, to the girls, guys, how the artists like respond, you know, are they shy? Are they out? Like, I love knowing these things. Cool. Um, Sometimes like on a, on a call, it'd be like the shyest person ever. And you see them at a show and you're like, wow, like that energy. And, and then I understand the artist, like all yeah. day you're charging all day. You're doing you're you have this shell so that when yep. you explode, it really makes it, you know what I mean? And so you got to be it. outside. Yeah. Yeah. That's sick. Um, no, it's great to hear that, that you're still in it because you know, there's, a, there are a lot of execs that kind of, uh, 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 they've been in it they get a little jaded they're phoning it in and I, I appreciate that you said that we're we're lucky to do what we do in, in the music industry and and i think uh that's a that's an important reminder for everybody working in the industry is just uh we're lucky to be here and and if uh you you don't like what you're doing then it might be time to find a different career path uh, and, and going yeah. back to what you're saying like may, maybe it's time we change the term bedroom dj you know what I'm saying? Like maybe sure. you should be maybe you should be a going outside DJ because I promise yeah. you it's so much easier <laughs> for you if you if you go outside. Like uh, if I, if you're Way outside, you meet the people, and I get yep. you know, people get to know you, and then you're like, here, check out my music. But if you're sitting in your yeah. com on behind uh, at home and doing it, it's completely different. Yeah, definitely. Uh, do you dis have you discovered artists in the club uh, that you've then reached out to is that is that a thing that kind of is part of your work uh, for? yeah I, I that's part of part of my job is going out and and discovering artists at clubs sometimes it's sometimes honestly it's the artists that are behind the artist like sometimes just being behind the uh, uh being in the booth with an artist and i'll be uh, someone will be like oh I, I you know i used to produce with him or oh we share mm. a studio together Oh, and cool. like the fact that he brought you with him or she brought you with him means that you guys are a crew and cool. They might be signed and they might be with like a major, but this person is, you know, 
just doing the same amount of work. He's literally at the yeah. same party, spending the same amount of time, probably can play the same music. So yeah. maybe let me listen to what, what they've got. Yeah. But, yeah. but I also great. DM no, artists great. a lot. I DM artists a lot. Oh yeah? Cool. A lot. I DM <laughs> artists a lot. Like I I hear if I hear a song and it and I'm like, this is different, I'll like do my like check out their read their bio, go on their Instagram, see who my friends follows them, um, check out their first post and their last post, and then be like, yo, this is a good song. I literally will just be like, yo, this is a good song. You should stay in this lane. I won't say anything else um Sick. and then like if they want to continue the convo they will but you know yeah no, that's great um in terms of like release frequency in the dance world uh and 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 how you release i know you said that you kind of we kind of operate in like a singles uh world these days uh just across the industry and that you're kind of focusing on that is it something that uh your you, you recommend your artists get on this like releasing schedule of, you know, a single a month or a single every three months or something like that. Is there a routine that you kind of recommend or is it just kind of when inspiration hits or is it something like, you know, work as long as you need to work to get the run one perfect track. And if that's one a year, we'll live with that. Like talk to me about just kind of what, what the, what are the expectations and, and just what are the recommendations these days? So but most of the time, it really every every artist producer uh, in the studio has their own kind of formula of how things work. Um, yeah, everyone like I know artists who will go spend a month record a hundred songs and then l spend the next few months playing out the records or just listening to them over and over and then being like, okay, ten out of those hundred and throw their other ninety away. That's one person's formula. I have someone else yep. who's starts literally January 2nd, we'll be like, yo, these are the next eight songs for the whole year. You decide how you want to put them out, right? Everyone mm -hmm. does something different. I, I When I go to the studio, I literally put a stopwatch or a timer and I'm like, I have to, here's my idea and I'm going to finish this in the next 90 minutes. I don't care what happens. It's just done in 90 minutes. I don't want to overthink yep. it. I don't want to, but that's, everyone has their own formula. In terms yeah. of frequency for DSPs, I don't think there's a right or wrong, man. But what I do think artists should start thinking about doing is removing songs. I think people is people removing forget. songs. Yeah. What do think you mean? about it like this. Think about it like this, right? Okay. All these DSPs have an algorithm, right? But the one of the yeah. biggest uh, parameters in an algorithm algorithm is your recency, like your last release yeah. record, right? And so yeah. a lot of times artists will see their monthly listeners go down or like whatever go down and it's because people were listening to your stuff and then you drop two more records but those records weren't as good and then they stopped listening to that first record and now the out, they're downplaying those records so now your ranking is going down but if you had huh. if you delete the last two records your ranking might go back up Do you know what i mean people it's like think about it, it's like your instagram like the like dsps are essentially social networks right now it's like content and they want frequency right. and they want what do you do on instagram you archive stuff that's not good yeah <laughs> wait so i mean that's fascinating because you'd think that there's these loyal listeners to some of your old stuff and that if you remove the the old records uh the listenership would actually go down because now those songs get removed from playlists well, those I, listeners I, aren't I gonna mean, be you, hearing those you look much, at but... you look at your artist profile right and you can tell like for example Sometimes I'll see like someone's uh, similar artists exactly the same. I'm like, yeah, all these similar artists make sure they drop a yeah. record or two. Those record go in a random playlist. Uh, someone in, in a random country starts playing it. And then all of a sudden their related artists are so random. It's no longer the yeah. artists that were actually similar. And so now huh. they're in a lane that's completely different than what they worked their whole life for. You know, so but, I mean, no one's going to do that to their biggest streaming records. But if you know that if record isn't as good, you should just remove it. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like, just mm -hmm. get rid of it. And like, if I went to someone's Spotify and I only saw three songs and they were all big numbers versus I went and saw 15 songs, two of them have big numbers and those came out three years ago. Everything after is low. What does that say? That artist is mm -hmm. not in an, that artist is in a decline, right? And you make a good point. Loyal fans that say, 
Hey, what happened to that record? Right. Awesome. Great. That fan is going to message you if they are and be like, yeah, here you go. They're like, damn, I love this artist. He took the song down and gave it to me. <laughs> like now you have a direct, you know what I'm saying? It's like a, it's like buying vinyl. Like it's, you can't even mm-hmm. get the song anymore on DSPs, but I have it and I got it from the artist. Right. Yeah. Like if you have loyal fans then yeah, I you mean, can have it on Bandcamp. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, that's a good point. I mean, that's really interesting because it's like, you know, it's it's almost the opposite of windowing, uh, where you you hold off from putting a song on streaming service, a new one, and you ha- ask people to buy it first, and then you put it on streaming service label later. You're kind of saying, you know, uh, maybe the underperforming songs or the old records, uh, you remove it from streaming services. So, I'm curious about your perspective of moving forward. I mean, is uh, is that a strategy that, uh, not just for like vanity metrics of just, it doesn't look as good or, or maybe how people are looking at it, but like, is there something to withholding songs, records from streaming services and only having it available for downloads or physical? In the, in the dance scene, there is for sure. Um, especially in the dance scene, because a lot of records don't necessarily have, and this is, I'm speaking across the globe. A lot sure. of records are unofficial remixes, uncleared samples. And you know what I'm mm. saying? And like, they yep. can't, if they blow up, they get taken down. You know yep. what I'm saying? So yep. the, all these records need a place to live besides mm. the club, because they are getting played in the club. They sure. are getting heard and they are getting Shazam, but they're not on DSP. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yep. So mm. maybe it comes up and then you remove it. The, the, I think. The important thing here is like we all the artists have the same access to the same tools, right? But it's how we use these tools differently. That's how you create the art. Like that's what we're talking about. Everything mm. you do should be art. So if yeah. I'm if I'm looking at my own profile, I'm like those three songs don't represent me at all. And like I don't mm. even play them. And I actually get pissed when people ask me because I'm like that's not my vibe anymore. Why yeah. archive them? Yeah. Like I think it adds more to me being an artist. Yeah, no, that's cool. I mean, you're curating your art, and uh, it's like your own your your Spotify profile is your your own art gallery. That's your personal yeah. gallery, and and you're you're curating that. So it makes and, a lot of and, sense. And, that's uh, and keep yeah. in mind, Spotify Spotify has discovery mode, right? In discovery mode, every time you add, like, the more records are in discovery mode, the more art fans are being exposed to stuff, even though they don't really want to listen to it, but they're like, hey, this is what's next. Now, what's next? Mm-hmm. Should it be one of my songs that I know is in my favorite or isn't the one that is connecting to most of my audience? Or should it just be the ones that I know are good? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Yeah. Really interesting. Um, cool. Well, Moody, this has been so fascinating. I know uh, people, you dropped so many gems and uh, everybody listening, I, I'm sure. Sh- I know is super appreciative of uh, your wisdom and and transparency with all of this. Um, I I have one final question that I ask everyone who comes on the show. And that is, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? Uh, From an executive standpoint or from an artist standpoint? Either one, you take it how you want. Um, Artist standpoint, I think it's when people take art and redo it in their own way. So whenever I see people make remixes on their own or, acoustic version like by themselves not paid from an influencer i'm like that is the biggest compliment like someone loves my song so much that they wanted to hear it in a different way um i love that i think that's that's the biggest compliment as an artist and as an executive it's um honestly not just uh not just on a royalty or revenue or any of that it's really like everyone around me improving like just pushing the average of everyone around me. And I think that's it, whether it's on mental health or physical health or in ear health, like uh, whatever it is, just hmm. pushing everyone around me to do things differently and, and like, forget cool. the status quo, like break every rule, you know, and, and, and the more conversations we have like this, the more we're like, why does this rule exist? Yeah. You know, love it. But, love it. Moody Jones. That was great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Today's episode was edited by Ari Davids with music by Brassroots District and produced by all the great people at Ari's Take.